Hello, I'm Cameo George, the new executive producer of American Experience, PBS's signature and longest running history series. Today, we're pleased to present a discussion around Vanguard, how black women broke barriers, won the vote, and insisted on equality for all, a new book by acclaimed historian and friend of American Experience, Martha Jones. Vanguard, released today by Basic Books, offers a sweeping history of the political lives of African-American women. It's the story of how they defied both racism and sexism and fought for, won, and used the right to vote. It's a history that extends into the present as the current conversation around systemic racism expands and the election draws nearer. We're presenting this conversation in conjunction with our encore broadcast of The Vote, airing Tuesdays in September at 8, 7 central, beginning tonight on PBS. The Vote tells the dramatic story of the hard-fought campaign waged by American women for the right to vote and features both of today's speakers. Now I'm pleased to introduce our special guests for today's conversation. Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. She is a past co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, the oldest and largest association of women historians in the United States. Author of Vanguard, Birthright Citizens, and All Bound Up Together, she has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, American Experience, and more. Marsha Chatlin is a professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University. She is the author of the recently released franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America and South Side Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration. Thank you all for being here. Please enjoy the conversation. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to Martha Jones, the author of Vanguard, which um, celebrates its publication day today, but had an early review in the New York Times and it was described as elegant and expansive. And I think that that is an apt way of describing your body of scholarship, Martha. Um, early on in the book, you talk about your, your family history, your ancestry, and you begin with Nancy Bell Graves. And in many ways, you find an entry point in your family's history to talk about Black women and voting. And you write, without the vote, Black Americans had to build other routes to political power. And throughout this book, we have various routes to um, the 19th Amendment. And so I would love to hear why you made the decision to begin in a period in which slavery is still um, present and vibrant in the United States and the ways that abolition and suffrage um, were joined together. Oh, thank you, first of all, Marcia, for being with me for this conversation. It's great to be face to face, even if it's on uh, Zoom. Um, and thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, it's not necessarily an orthodox way to begin a history book with family, um, with the word I, uh, mine, ours. Um, but in many turns in this book, um, the women in my family really did show me the way. Um, and Nancy Bell Graves, who uh, does not live long enough to see anything like the 19th Amendment, um, was a reminder to me to, um, think hard if I was going to account for her daughters who and her granddaughter, her great granddaughter, all of whom are living in 1920 and do confront the challenges of voting rights in that really landmark year. Um, what did Nancy Belgraves bequeath to them that they were women who might wrestle with that and how might that make their stories distinct? And so she becomes a, an important touchstone for me in um, really revising early chapters to recover as best we can 
um, in particular, the ways in which uh, enslaved women um, resist and make a record and put on the table for the nation, in fact, the scourge of sexual violence. Um, and so that hadn't been um, in my first pass of a political history, um, but her presence in my mind sort of insisted that I return to that. And as the book unfolds, um, we get this period from the end of slavery um, into the 20th century, where women in various communities were asking this question about what does it mean to be a full participant in society? And you trace the various ways that black women are institution building in the years before um, the formal um, suffrage movement as we recognize it broadly is happening. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the importance of institution building for black women's advocacy for the vote? Sure, you know, one of the early myths about black women in politics, particularly in early America, was that they weren't interested in politics because they didn't show up in women's conventions like Seneca Falls and the conventions of the 1850s. So my work was to, in a sense, move away from those spaces and ask where were black women? And it turns out they are building institutions like churches, um, particularly I look at black Methodist churches. Um, they are building um, literary societies, um, benevolent societies. Um, they are part of the um, early women's um, anti-slavery um, coming together. Um, and it turns out that when we move away from sort of women's spaces, um, particularly women's political spaces that are dominated by white American women, we find black women not only building institutions, but in the building of those institutions, um, then beginning to ask questions about how much power, how much authority um, they can actually exercise in those spaces that they've built. In addition to your vast knowledge of the 19th century and the early 20th century, in the documentary, The Vote, you talk about the various ways um, race is at the heart of shaping some of the choices in the suffrage movement. And we have a clip from The Vote that um, I think really captures the complexity in the story you tell. If we could show that, and then we'll talk about that. Alice Paul and her staff do an incredible amount of outreach. They are reaching out to nearby states, to colleges, to small suffrage groups, anybody they can think of who would be interested in coming to demonstrate at the White House uh, for the suffrage amendment. So desperate was Paul for fresh recruits that she even issued invitations to local African-American activists setting aside her deep conviction that their presence risked turning a woman's protest into a racial one. 53-year-old Mary Church Terrell, a charter member of the NAACP and a longtime suffragist, answered the call more than once, though she'd long ago resigned herself to the fact that white suffragists typically found it more expedient to exclude her. If you're a black woman, White women's racism is not news. Racism is the order of the day. You know what that is. But that's not exactly a reason to stay home. African-American women understood that the right to vote was yet another tool to try to dismantle the structures that were still in place even after the end of slavery and to ensure African-American safety and perhaps prosperity. So Mary Church Terrell was willing to join white women's protests to the extent that she believed it would ultimately deliver the vote for black women. For every show of solidarity, however, there was a defection. Paul was bombarded with letters protesting the picket, resignations, cancellations of the suffragist, even a plea from her mother to call off what she described as the undignified annoying of the president. Instead, the vigil continued, day in and day out, usually six days a week. By way of explanation, 
Paul offered an analogy. If a creditor stands before a man's house all day long demanding payment of his bill, the man must either remove the creditor or pay the bill. Alice has never lost her focus on Woodrow Wilson. In all of these years, it's always been about Woodrow Wilson. And it's still about Woodrow Wilson, the man in the White House. From the clip in um, the vote, we see the various ways that, um, as you said, Black women are showing up and there is this, there is a series of moves in the suffrage movement that um, are about both gender and race together. And while the national suffrage organizations are making their appeals to the Wilson White House, how would you capture the spirit of what Black women are doing politically in that period right before the ratification? I think they're doing two things. Um, on the one hand, they're attempting to keep, um, uh, you know, at least a part of a foot in the, in the, in the suffrage scene, right? It, that, that's being run by NASA and later the National Women's Party. Um, I think it's very important, right? To, to show up um, and to not cede right, wholesale, the steering of women's political futures uh, to white women, even as that requires then a confrontation in very different ways with anti-black racism. So I think there is that. And at the same time, um, black women are juggling um, adeptly, but they are juggling um, the politics of the vote um, with the politics of anti-lynching and much more. And um, so part of what I try and do in Vanguard is sort of pull back from some of these you know, defining scenes to say, look at what else black women are having to contend with. You know, by 1914, um, on the floor of the US Senate, there are proposals that would repeal the 15th amendment, mm -hmm. which had prohibited the states from using race as a criteria for voting in exchange for a, a women's suffrage amendment. Black women have to contend with all those pieces um, and much more, particularly in the Wilson years. Um, and that means that um, they're never um, able to reduce themselves, if you will, to a single question or a single um, issue movement like the movement for women's suffrage. One of the questions I'm sure you get a lot, and after people see the vote, they ask these questions about um, sisterhood across the color line or feelings of betrayal. And from my perspective, I think Black women were always prepared for these types of fights. What do you think um, prepared Black women to um, know how to keep a foot in that space? in light of all of these um, different negotiations of their rights? Um, I think part of the story lies in, um, in local scenes rather than on the national front, right? We know, for example, that Ida Wells in Chicago, who is you know, very um, crudely rebuffed in Washington when she shows up to Alice Paul's um, women's parade in March of 1913, she's traveled there with white suffragists from Chicago, whom she considers to be sort of sisters in the struggle. And so I do think there's a way, and we can see that in New York in many places, there are possibilities at least, there are conditions in which women are still um, working sometimes awkwardly, but are working across a kind of color line. Um, but in national politics, um, I think that line hardens um, and is very difficult to traverse except episodically. Um, and so I do think black women are prepared and they know white women well. Um, and if the story was one about black women and their wounds around racism, there'd be no story here, right? Because racism is, is ubiquitous, uh, regrettably.
And in what ways um, were Black women also engaging in the question of um, the gender politics within Black communities? This is something that you touch upon, um, especially as you see women in the context of church organizations or intellectual societies also making a case in front of Black men for their suitability for this responsibility. Right. So talk about juggling, right? Um, you're, you're negotiating with white suffragists in a very bumpy terrain. And then you're in your church community, um, your black Methodist and Baptist communities, which are huge, include hundreds of thousands, millions of black Americans, or you're in a nascent civil rights organization like the NAACP um, and you're discovering um, that there are all sorts of ideas and all sorts of barriers that are gonna keep you from fully realizing your political potential. Um, black women have to navigate that also and are deeply invested in those institutions. They've helped build them, they've given birth to them metaphorically. And now, however, they're gonna face some men who find that those spaces need to be necessarily men's spaces, but they'll also find allies. And I think that's an important part of the story is that there are also black men who become allies um, in this struggle. In the period of time after the 19th Amendment and before the signing of the Civil Rights Act, we have 45 years of really critical history that um, your book does an excellent job of saying, okay, after we get to the 19th Amendment, there's so much more and you don't rush through that period of time. So what do you think are the pivotal shifts that need to happen um, between a constitutional amendment and such a powerful piece of civil rights legislation in order for this struggle to continue to have residence. It's important to say that immediately in 1920 with ratification of the 19th Amendment, Black women call for a federal uh, legislation. They call for federal legislation that would give teeth to the 19th Amendment as well as the 15th Amendment. They think they need federal legislation to wipe out the Jim Crow laws that are gonna to keep too many of them from the polls, especially in the South. So this is the agenda in 1920. It takes 45 years, as you say. And part of that story is about black women not taking disfranchisement um, as somehow defining of their political possibilities, right? I write about Mary McLeod Bluthune, the Florida-based educator and suffragist, who by the 30s comes to Washington DC and is gonna to learn to use lobbying and patronage and um, party politics um, to get herself appointed in Washington, even as she can't vote, no less be elected out of the state of Florida. So in some sense, you can't tell the story of how black women get to the vote without appreciating the politics that it takes to do that. And Bethune lays a foundation in those years by not only situating herself, but scores of other black women in federal agencies where they are now meeting out resources, they're learning how to do politics. Um, and this is part of how we get to ultimately that federal legislation, right? Is black folks at the table. And if we can't get elected, um, well, let's see what we can do by way of political allyship. And Bethune is masterful at this and really is a bridge to the modern civil rights era. And in Vanguard, you talk about um, this history that um, when you put black women at the center of American political history, the periodization changes, you meet some familiar um, people in history, but you see them from a different perspective, whether it's um, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who I think increasingly is becoming understood as a suffragist, as well as folks like Rosa Parks. So at the point where there is the mid-century civil rights movement, where people are starting to see voting rights as part of um, a series of demands um, that African-Americans are making, what role does, do women play in that translation process of the gap between um, you know, what's constitutionally uh, granted and what's actually experienced? Yeah, this is, um, you know, uh, the, I think, just um, arresting work of someone like Fannie Lou Hamer, um, 
and Hamer um, is just an example of the ways in which now I think what's different is um, a politics that um, we sometimes refer to as grassroots, right? That um, if Bethune had been an educator and hobnobbed with the Roosevelt's, um, modern civil rights um, is the terrain in which um, black women begin to speak. Now, now Bethune herself, right, is the daughter of, of sharecroppers um, from South Carolina. Um, but that's not how she positions herself quite in Washington. But Hamer comes right, right up out of that experience um, and is now, um, I think in an interesting way, um, there's an organic, right? There's an organic quality um, to our rootedness um, in black women's politics um, that is no longer performing for um, the back rooms of Washington. It is performing for um, the television camera, right? And, and the news photographer, and that's important, um, but is much more situated um, in real place and in real time. Um, and black women do the courageous work as I try and explain, it's literally the body, right? It's, it's literally putting bodies on the line. And we know that story from the, the, the vivid, um, footage of the uh, attempted crossing of the Edmund Prentice Bridge, for example. But that is a, a very dramatic rendering of, I think, the everyday experience of African-American women in this voting rights scene. They remain as vulnerable in some ways as their foremothers did to violence and sexual violence. Um, but there's nothing um, shy of that, in a sense, that is going to propel this issue onto the front burner in Washington, um, politicking in Washington isn't getting the work done. Um, it's going to require that work on the ground and the work of black men, women's bodies on the front lines. And you, you mentioned something um, really important. You talk about media. You talk about the idea of the black woman representing um, kind of politics or certain ideas. How do you think um, the presence of black women as spokespeople or representative of the struggle to vote. How do you think that um, over this period of time, how does that change and why do you think it's effective in certain moments? Well, I mean, um, I think it's not a mistake, for example, that a figure like Rosa Parks gets um, mythologized, um, nearly canonized, right? That there is something um, particular about her black woman body um, that permits us as a nation collectively to incorporate her, or to adopt her. So there's a long story, I think, about the way in which womanhood, to some degree for black women, serves as a, a, a partial cloak, um, permits them to be um, public and present in ways that are um, dangerous and maybe even out of bounds for African-American men. Um, and at the same time, I think that um, what I hope I've done in Vanguard is highlight how, um, how profoundly um, risky that was on the one hand, and also that not all black women um, stand in the same posture right in front of the camera. I compare a Fannie Lou Hamer who is masterful in front of a camera, masterful. She understands television and how that medium works and how it projects and how it frames her, not only her image, but her words, her gestures and more. Um, and then I contrast her to someone like Diane Nash, right, who is the architect of the Sel Selma campaign, um, but is not one that we find very often in front of the cameras. Um, and so it's important, I think, to um, allow for, um, you know, the wholeness of Black women's leadership styles. And it's not all, um, it's not all pegged to um, national television cameras. Um, it is also about that absolutely um, in the trenches work that someone like Diane Nash is doing um, to get folks there. And one of the uh, things that you talk about in Vanguard, and I really appreciate because increasingly, um, I think it's important for us to understand that once 65 happens, 
people are not just registering to vote and they're not just voting, they're running for office. And what happens in that period between let's say 65 and 85 that um, extends the story of black women and the right to vote um, from your perspective? Right, so the Voting Rights Act um, has transformed the political landscape for the nation um, by now um, lifting the Jim Crow restrictions that had kept so many millions of Black Americans from the polls. What to do with that power, I think, is the first sort of question. And uh, so I write about a Shirley Chisholm, right, who, believe, who begins her political work in locally, right, in Brooklyn, New York, um, serving in the state, um, the state house in Albany there, um, comes to Congress in 1968. And by 1972, is running for the Democratic nomination. In my view, what is Chisholm doing? Well, the likelihood that Chisholm is gonna win the Democratic nomination is slim to none, I think we might say. But Chisholm understands, right, that she stands in a historical moment when now it's necessary to ignite, if you will, that those millions of black Americans who have been um, oppressed and suppressed politically. Um, and she has the capacity to do that in a sense by her, um, by the novelty, right? And, you know, and by the fascination and by her own extraordinary brilliance and charisma, um, she is able to ignite uh, this electorate, right? And be part of a process that contributes to not her own nomination, right, by the Democrats, but does contribute to then inspiring and awakening um, other Black women and men, right, who are now differently positioned. One of the things um, that I didn't know about Chisholm um, is that one of her first volunteers in her run for the presidency is today, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California. That's the story, right, of someone like Chisholm, her own remarkableness, but how, right, she creates a space, an experience, a campaign, an opening into politics that women of great consequence then step into. And we see them, um, yes, eventually um, arriving in Congress, and there are those that do, but I think as importantly, we see them as mayors, as coming into state assemblies, holding local and state level office, um, which is of tremendous consequence for Black Americans. That is not a sidebar, even as I think sometimes in our sort of media, you know, kind of lens, it seems like the only thing that's important is Washington. It turns out not to be the case at all. Um, and so it really is in those years, we see women behind the scenes in the Democratic Party, right? It, it, it's now exercising leadership. Fannie Lou Hamer was an insurgent in 1964 in the Democratic Party. But by 1985, Black women are inside the party calling shots and more. Um, and that is the foundation in my view for what we see in 2020. Well, one of the things um, uh, in Shirley Chisholm's um, documentary is Barbara Lee talks about how Shirley Chisholm, I think visits Mills College and she asked her, are you registered to vote? And she said, no. And she just jumped right in. And I think that when we talk about political participation and women, the conventional wisdom is that you have to ask a woman, have you ever thought about running? And then she says, oh, maybe I will. And so when we think about the ascendancy of black women, um, particularly in the democratic party, what do you, um, what do you think are other kind of, um, I think drivers of that political participation in terms of external forces. What's at stake after the right to vote is secured in 65 that keeps people still engaged and concerned about the political process? Why does it not just end with the vote? Well, I guess I'd say it never was only about the vote, right? It, it, so it, now I'll go back to Mrs. Bethune, right, and say you know, Mary McLeod Bethune um, is the inspiration for Val Demings. Um, Bethune never holds office, 
right? She never is elected to any post, but Val Demings from Florida today, the Congresswoman would tell you, right? That when she was a girl, it was Mary McLeod Bethune who modeled, who showed who she could be. So I think it was never about the vote only. And what I admire, I'm gonna invoke Stacey Abrams um, if I could, because Leader Abrams is a wonderful example that I think um, echoes the ways in which black women have long practiced politics. She pivots, right, out of a moment in which she not only is vying for, I think by many accounts, we would say she had won the governorship of Georgia, um, never concedes that, but also doesn't sit there um, and wait for the next election cycle to turn. Um, she pivots to create fair fight um, and to work on voting rights. And I think this is the kind of broad political vision that black women had to develop when in the era of disfranchisement, but it's not, I think, disappeared at all. I think it's still with us. I, I'm someone who admires Mrs. Obama, who says, I'll never hold office. Um, I'm not interested in politics. Um, but we know how hard she has worked in these years around voter education, voter registration, voter turnout. And I frankly see them as political, that is as political um, as, um, you know, Senator Harris, right, who's running for vice presidency. And that is the signature, I think, of Black women's politics, is that nimbleness, is that savvy, um, as, which is a reflection, I think, of an ethos that says, Political power is not um, is not an embodiment of my personal ego aspirations, right? P political power has a purpose, and it can take many forms. Um, and if my purpose is my community, if my purpose is all of humanity, which is what some Black women will say. Um, I can realize that purpose through many kinds of means. It doesn't have to be um, through party politics um, and being elected. In the final pages of Vanguard, everyone read it. Um, you, you, know, you gesture to the folks now who are out here, um, people like Stacey Abrams, um, Kamala Harris, um, you know, uh, former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. And I think the deep um, poignancy of this story is that there is still the question of enfranchisement in certain communities and the question of access to the vote. And so as people um, prepare themselves uh, for another presidential election and for the smaller local level races, how do you think um, this history helps inform our own um, approach to the challenges today of access to voting and the ways that gender and elections are still um, an important way of understanding Black women's political participation? Um, when we look at 1920 through the perspective of African-American women, it is clear that it was an era, new era of voter disenfranchisement, right? It was a voter suppression, right? It, to use 21st century parlance is what kept Black women from the polls. Um, and here we sit in 2020, um, you know, less than 60 days out from um, uh, a consequential election. And we recognize that voter suppression will, threatens right, to profoundly shape um, the outcome of that election. Um, 1920 is a reminder that voter suppression is as deep, if not more deeply entrenched in our political culture than our voting rights, right? Voting rights, full voting rights, 1965 to Shelby versus Holder in 2013, when the Voting Rights Act is gutted, is as good as it gets in our history. And it is a short moment relative to the long history of voter suppression. So here we are, in a sense, returned to um, our tradition. Um, what I know from the women in Vanguard is that 
um, among the things that are necessary in the crunch, right, is the ground game. And the women I write about organize suffrage schools and citizenship schools in 1919 and 1920. They train one another um, how to get to the polls, how to pay a poll tax, how to pass a literacy test, um, how to avoid the problem of an understanding clause, um, how to turn out in numbers that um, help them help shield them from violence, right? That, that, that is a ground game and black women do that groundwork um, in order to get as many of them as possible to the polls in 1920. Anybody who's wondering about how best to approach November of 2020, I recommend you tune in to the black women in your community, to their networks, to their strategies, to their organizing, which has had to adapt right, to um, the exigencies of many things, including COVID-19. Um, but what we know is that the history of Black women, the practice of Black women in our own time is one about that ground game, about um, getting registered, getting to the polls, getting those votes counted. Um, and I suspect, um, I don't, not, no, I won't just say I suspect, mm -hmm. I know, right, what's happening, right, is an adaptation of all that um, for our, our regrettable 21st century conditions. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we open it up to the audience for questions, but um, I have to ask you about the title and the process of writing this book. This is your third single authored book as um, a historian and as um, someone with extensive legal training. Um, how did um, this book differ from some of your other work? And how did you come to the title of Vanguard? Um, I hope this is different. I like every book to be different. I, that's something to know about me, which is to say um, I've never written two books that are quite the same. My last book um, was a very um, specialist uh, history of birthright citizenship. It was written for legal historians. It was a much, very much an insider's book. Um, but this book, which was expressly written to be um, read and engaged in this anniversary year and beyond, um, was written with a much broader readership in mind. Um, so here I had to become a storyteller um, more so than I had ever been. Um, I had to really use the words, the feelings, the actions, the experiences of the women who animate Vanguard. Um, I had to really um, hold that up and kind of suppress my own um, kind of analytic thinking about those things to let those women really speak for themselves as we sometimes say. Um, and I had to write a story, it turned out, that spanned 200 years because um, the, the women kept saying, no, no, you, 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 you're, you're starting too soon, you're ending too early, um, you know, that I really had to follow um, the lead of the women who stories I, I shepherd in this particular book. Um, and they required me to write about a long 200 years um, and to abandon a narrative that could have started in Seneca Falls and ended with um, the 19th Amendment. There was a second part to your question. The process, um, what was it like writing? Oh, well, you know, um, I was very lucky um, because I have wonderful students at Johns Hopkins and I was teaching alongside writing. Now, you know what that's like. Um, it's very hard to find time for all of that. Um, so I took my students on the journey of writing this book and they read this book with me um, in its rough chapters over, um, over a whole year. Um, and they were my best readers and my um, toughest critics. Um, all the errors, as we say, are mine, but I owe a great debt to my students who um, became as invested in these women as I had become, um, but had their own perspectives as readers from a slightly different vantage point that really helped me then to think I was writing a book that would speak to a broad readership and not just to specialists. Well, I'm grateful um, to your students and <laughs> for being part of this process. And I'm grateful to um, your family that appears um, in this book as well. And in the same way that um, the writing of it was an intergenerational um, journey, um, the, the 
the writing of it is also about generations coming together to see and appreciate both change and challenges that stay with us. And so with that, I'd like to um, offer some questions from the audience. Right. Um, we have one question from YouTube about the legacy of Alice Paul um, and the ways that Mary Church, uh, Terrell and Polly Murray um, speak favorably of Paul um, and how that is in conflict or in contrast perhaps of um, Alice Paul's own positions on black women and suffrage. Um, it is important to acknowledge that women, black suffragists um, are admiring um, selectively um, and, uh, and with uh, eyes wide open. Um, there's a great deal to admire about someone like Alice Paul. Um, her political savvy, her her courage, her capacity for political theater. I I think the women in Vanguard have the ability to both admire that, um, but that does not lead, in my read, to close collaboration, right, or or intimate allyship between women. It is possible to admire people from a distance, to admire facets of them, um, and Paul is an example of that. Um, and at the same time, um, recognize that that doesn't always lay the ground work for um, an allyship. Alice Paul will, in essence, leave Black women behind in 1920 um, with full knowledge that they need um, federal legislation if they're going to get to the polls in the South. Um, Paul will move on to the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and that is also true even as one might admire Alice Paul and what she was able to do for the 19th Amendment. Another question comes from Facebook. Where does the narrative of the failure of the next steps like the ERA fit into the story? Um, I think that um, we're not sure about the failure of the ERA. I guess it's important to say, and my, my friend Carol Jennings and her comrades in the ERA coalition are um, hard at work still on seeing the ERA through, and I hope they get that opportunity to see it through. Um, but I appreciate the question, um, or what I hear in the question is, you know, how do you think about politics as the long game that it, that it actually is, right? Um, and nothing exemplifies that more than the story of Vanguard and the 200 years right, that Black women um, spend building um, political acumen, savvy skill, but access, power, and more. Um, that's an important insight from this, that when we sit in any given election cycle and we're frustrated either by the process, we're frustrated by the candidates, um, that that is, the, that is what politics is. And the, the transformations through that mainstream fraught space um, require um, persistence. There's a word that comes sort of out of our gloss on the suffrage movement. It requires persistence and tenacity. Um, and some of the women in Vanguard live very long lives, like Mary Church Terrell, like Mary McLeod Bethune. And we watch how they evolve across those lives. Bethune begins you know, as an educator building a school in Daytona, Florida. And by 1945, she's at the founding of the United Nations. There's a heck of an arc of a, a political <laughs> career. Um, and that's what I think politics is. And um, and there is a challenge for each of us individually and for us collectively to build into our work that kind of longevity, because I think nothing short of that, nothing short of a willingness to be in it for the long game um, will win gains in the mainstream political realm. Um, you know, you, you brought up uh, Bethune and the United Nations, and I was curious, um, in your research process, how did global politics play a role in the ways that Black women created political strategies around suffrage and other related issues? Well, if we go back, you know, to um, as early as someone like Ida Wells, um, we know that Wells picks up really on the abolitionist tradition, right, of touring um, the United Kingdom and lecturing on anti-lynching um, in an effort to shame the United States, right? So there is that, the way in which um, women like Wells are, and, and um, 
uh, Terrell, um, Bethune, right, are going to head to Europe in part for their own edification and their own networks, but also because they're looking for fresh political, uh, fresh critical vantage points on what's happening and not happening in the US. Um, by the time, um, you know, the internationalist vision as, as historians like um, Keisha Blaine have um, uh, told it in their work um, is an important one, always an important um, alternative um, in black politics, particularly in the era of disfranchisement um, when black Americans need to develop political imaginations that are not bound by um, the, um, the discrimination and the oppression that they confront in the US. So the Garvey movement, for example, which is a pan-Africanist organization, um, draws women out of suffrage um, and into a pan-African global movement precisely because suffrage feels like it just will not take black women where they wanna go. Um, so it is, it is part of the ways in which black women develop their ideas. It's part of how they make politics. And for Bethune, I think it is um, transformative in 1945 for her to get to San Francisco to discover that the black men in her delegation aren't really interested in um, developing much of a collaboration with her, but that there is a framework around women of color, anti-colonialism that fits extremely well with her critique of racism and Jim Crow um, at home. Um, and so there, I think Bethune does find a, a meaningful sisterhood and a new way of framing her Black women's politics now as global politics in 1945. And when we think about, um, you know, the early um, platform for Black women in politics, people often think of Shirley Chisholm. And we get a question, we have a question from uh, YouTube about um, Chisholm's statement that she received more opposition by being a woman than she did from being black. And, you know, we all know that, you know, Shirley Chisholm was kind of known for her, um, her pat comments. And so um, I have some thoughts about this, but the question is for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I, I would love to, Can you, you know, because Shirley Chisholm always also said, you know, I'm not the candidate of black people. I'm not the candidate of women. I'm the candidate of all people. Um, but I think all of that tells us that Chisholm is um, laser tuned in to um, the politics of racism and the politics of gender um, in the you know, post Voting Rights Act era um, and understands, I think most importantly, that um, the part of the burden that black women bear when they step to the podium is helping varied audiences um, read them, find them legible, understandable, right? She has to interpret who she is when she stands it because people, it doesn't, quite compute, right? A black woman in politics, a black woman in Congress, a black woman running for um, the presidential nomination. Um, and so there's a lot of that kind of talk from Chisholm. You're right, because she's witty um, and, and more, but it's also because her circumstances, I think, demand that she offer an explanation and she position herself um, by way of the existing imaginations that Americans have. And I think that statement is reflects that. But what do you think? I'm, I'm, I am interested. You know, I, I think that, um, I think that it's not um, indicative of her entire set of experiences, but I think because um, of the context of, of what happened to her at the Democratic National Convention, I think that there was a sense of some betrayal from men in the Congressional Black Caucus. But if you look at her relationship to white feminists, I wonder if she would have um, suggested something else, right? And so I, I think that she was someone who probably um, illustrates the complexity of the women that you focus on, that how are you going to navigate sexism and racism in a way to help really show um, what you're up against as well as I think highlight your brilliance and to be, to be able to strategize around that. And I think um, that leads me to my next question about kind of genealogies, that what 
um, Vanguard highlights is the moments where different women are intersecting in um, organizations where they're conflicting in movements and how they are able to kind of create routes, um, back to our original word here, um, for each other. And so if you were to think about some of those kind of crucial genealogies of Black women's um, political work, um, where are the different places, um, would you map them or where did you find them, um, these, wow. these different ways? You know, in the years after 1920, um, I became very interested in Washington because the women I write about show up there um, in many different guises. And, you know, some of them are um, mature women who, um, whose political sensibilities have indeed been forged in the strife around women's suffrage, right? And the problem of um, racism and hierarchy, racial hierarchy as um, inextricable from women's politics. Um, and Bethune, I think, though works her way through that um, and she overlaps with somebody like Nanny Helen Burroughs, another um, educator, right, school founder like Bethune, but a, a, a two gener almost two generations certainly one, one full generation um, after Bethune, um, who begins her work in, um, importantly in the Black Baptist Church, but will be active long enough to be um, experienced and be part of the movement that we call interracial cooperation. And it's, I hadn't expected to find that, but why that's important is that it really, to me, is a resetting of the, of the equation, right? Interracial cooperation is not the suffrage hierarchy with white women on top and black women sort of ancillary or on bottom or jettisoned altogether. Interracial cooperation, that movement begins from the premise that black and white people share a table. They come to the table as equals. And, and um, Burroughs is someone who's very moved by her encounter with um, interracial cooperation, very moved by being, you know, at a, a at a southern political gathering where she fit, sits, you know, choose your metaphor, right, face to face, she stands toe to toe, but she comes away having experienced um, a political uh, conversation and dialogue where um, she is, the premise is that she's an equal. And um, so, so it's today, um, generations matter right, for um, the, the, the context and the framing, um, long life matters too, because I think Bethune also benefits, if you will, from the opportunity to think through the lens of interracial cooperation. Um, but the point being, it's not all the same at all. And in your assessment, um, in our final two questions, um, since we are in an election year and we have seen um, some kind of new rising stars, um, in the political process, other than Stacey Abrams, you have women like Cori Bush, you have Lauren Underwood, you have Ayanna Presley, um, a generation of um, Black political women who are as informed by maybe the movement for Black lives as they are for, you know, having gone to college, which is also a transitional thing for some of the women um, that you talk about. How do you think, um, your, uh, if you had to rewrite <laughs> um, mm. a chapter um, in five years when people say we need another chapter of Vanguard, how would you assess um, not only um, the rise of Kamala Harris, but this cohort of black women in elective office today? Yeah. Um, I've already mentioned that there are somewhere between, I think I've already mentioned that 120 and 130 black women running for Congress. Um, this season. It is a record shattering number of black women. Um, I understand our um, wonderful preoccupation with Senator Harris, um, but it shouldn't be lost on us that she was part of a field that included six black women, six. Um, what that tells me is that we are moving in a sense, beyond uh, 
black women's firsts, right? Black women is shattering glass ceilings or breaking barriers, though there's some of that still to be done. Um, what I see is black women as a force and um, perhaps understandably in Vanguard, my, my vantage point is backwards looking because I'm writing a history. So I write about contemporary women um, like Loretta Lynch, like Stacey Abrams and Leader Abrams and others um, uh, looking backwards and asking, listening for their explications of sort of the political tradition out of which they come. Um, that's important. Um, but if I were to write one more chapter, I think it would be themed on this emergence of black women as a force, whether it's 98% of black women in Alabama that help push Doug Jones um, uh, over, over the line and into the US Senate flipping that seat um, from red to blue, um, or it is the 120 or so black women running for office, or it is that field of six. Um, to me is, um, yes, a tribute to black women's tenacity and the insistence on being in politics for the long game. Um, but it is about black women having now emerged as a force of consequence. And so when I say, if you wanna understand how to get out the vote in November, you should you know, study black women, um, I mean it. And, um, and black women are understudied still in American politics. They have for too long been, I think tragically assumed to be transparent um, and uh, predictable and of, of, of too little consequence that my colleagues in political science have frankly too little to say uh, about how we get to this moment. Um, so for me, um, I think the last chapter is about what it means for black women to emerge as a force, how they prepared themselves, we prepared ourselves for this moment in history. And so when the opportunities arise, we create some opportunities and we step into others. Um, and it turns out um, Joe Biden, for example, has six black women um, to seriously vet, um, not, not simply one or, or even two. So I think it's moving from first to force, a force that um, is the, would be the next chapter and, um, and we'll all stay tuned and, and watch it um, in many ways write itself. Um, we're approaching a, a, um, an election of tremendous consequence and I would never downplay the stakes in November, but I am someone who believes that um, that force of black women in politics um, will not be deflated or dissipated or um, disappeared, whatever the results are in November. I think what we're seeing is a, is a permanent and enduring um, an important shift in the political landscape and our analyses demand that we understand it um, and know where it comes from and, and what its underpinnings are. Um, because whatever the outcome is in November, I don't think the women who are out front, black women who are out front in American politics today are going anywhere. That's what Stacey Abrams taught us mm -hmm. is that you can have an election stolen from you and you do not fold, right? You, you, you regroup and you continue the struggle. What a beautiful way to end. Um, as you said, the women in your book are enduring. Um, they are important. And um, so is this incredible book, Vanguard. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you so much, Marcia. Thanks to PBS and the American Experience for having us. Thank you, Martha and Marcia, for this powerful and timely conversation. On behalf of American Experience, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I encourage you to check out Martha's new book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, now available at most major booksellers. And please don't forget to tune in tonight at 8, 7 central as we begin our rebroadcast of The Vote on PBS and visit pbs.org slash American Experience for more about our series.
Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.